So hi, everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for coming to this webinar. Um, this is a public talk, and we called it Catastrophe to Opportunity, COVID and the Creative Industries in Southwest England. And it's been organized by um, Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. I just want to say many thanks to Bo and Juliet for who have organized the session. They've done great. And I want to say thank you to Alex Duarte Davies, Mel Rodriguez, and Jack Gibbon, who are the three panelists that, are going to be talk that I'm going to be chairing a conversation with. Um, later on. Um, just before I get into that, I'll just talk a little bit about what Bristol and Bath Creative R&D is. It's a first of a kind collaboration um, between the region's four universities. So that's UE Bristol, Bath Spa, University of Bath and the University of Bristol um, and, and the Digital Creative Centre Watershed. The program connects the world's worlds of university research and creative business to develop a shared vision for tomorrow's creative industries. Core part of the program or what we're calling the Pathfinders. And these are themed creative R&D projects designed to lead the Bristol and Bath cluster, so it's a cluster of creative industries, um, into the future to engage with emergent technologies and develop a diverse new talent base. There are five, currently five Pathfinders running from 2019 until 2023 um, with digital placemaking, expanded performance, amplified publishing to date, and the forthcoming creative ecologies. So that's four, and there's one more that's, that's coming on the back of that. Um, the, the cluster program has an events program. So it allows us to share our thoughts, conversations, and the work that we're doing across the cluster. And you can sign up for the future talks at bristolbathcreative.org. I think Bo will probably put the link um, in the chat. Um, yeah, one other thing before, okay, so after our discussion, the way it's gonna work is I'll present some of my work and then we're gonna facilitate a discussion between the three panelists after they do a little bit of a presentation of their experiences. Um, we'll be answering your questions, but please send them through using the Q&A function and not the chat. Um, so do send your questions through as you, as you have them during the talk to avoid a rush at the end. And that's in the Q&A panel, not the chat. So Juliet and Bo will need to make a, you know, make a point of that, so the Q&A function. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to my slides if that's okay. Um, my name is Tarek Barani, I'm an Associate Professor of Creative Industries. Um, at UE Bristol, and we commissioned, or we commissioned a piece of internal research looking at the effect of COVID-19 on the creative and cultural industries in, in the Southwest region. Um, and that ran from April to December 2020. And right now I'm in the throes of sort of analyzing, analyzing that, that research, and the report should be, should be finished, hopefully, um, and available to everybody by the end of March, early April. Um, that'll be free to, to get, um, and it'll, it'll be available on the on the cluster's website. But if anybody has any um, questions about that, please do, do hit me up on the chat. Um, I'm going to start with the slides. So I'm going to start talking about some of the research, the research that we did as a background to this. So the research itself is called From Catastrophe to Opportunity, Unpacking the Impact of COVID-19 on the Creative and Cultural Industries in Southwest England. Um, next slide, please. And just before I get into what we did, our research questions, you know, some, these are some pretty gloomy numbers um, that were projected by the Creative Industries Federation, who were the first kind of on the scene to really try and um, grapple with some of the statistics and the data around the impact of this, um, this terrible pandemic on the creative and cultural sector. And as you can see, um, you know, revenues lost and jobs lost are, are pretty huge here. Film, TV, video, radio, and photography end up losing, I guess, the, sorry, the projected losses were the most, 36. 36 billion. Um, I believe the second biggest subsector is um, advertising and market research, and the third was music performing and visual arts. Um, a lot of this of these statistics are actually going to be available in in the report that I've that I'm putting together right now as we speak. Um, can we move to the next slide, please. So. What we did is we used surveys, interviews, and case studies to ask four specific questions, four or five, but these are the four that we rested on um, about the creative and cultural sector in the Southwest. Um, we asked in specifically what ways was, has the COVID-19 outbreak affected the sectors of the creative and cultural economy in the Southwest region? How has the sector as a whole transitioned as a response to the crisis? How can the sector as a whole be made more adaptable or resilient? And what might recovery look like? That big circle was supposed to be over the third so basically what this talk is about and actually what a lot of the, the report's going to be about, which is this notion of adaptability and resilience um, in the sector. And it's not to take away from, from the negative impact that COVID-19 has had 
you know, on, on the sector at all. This is just talking about some of the stuff that's come out of the research that we find really interesting around this notion of adaptability and resilience. Um, and I'll just get, get right to it. So if we go to the next slide. So I know you can't really see what's on the left, but this is annual turnover projections for 2021, 2020 to 2021. And this was for all the survey respondents. And we had a total of 322 respondents to this survey. And on the left, the, what you can't see is actually, um, it's the turnover projections by, by different percentages, right? But I kind of basically, you know, I summarized everything on the right here. So what you see here in front of you is that 9% that of the survey res the respondents actually reported an increase in projected turnover during the pandemic. This is the first wave. This is from April till um, October, right? 13% remain stable, right? So that's about 22% of survey respondents that have either remained stable or actually became more productive as a result of the, uh, the pandemic. Of course, the rest, 80, 88%, there was a decrease in projected turnover, which is what we're seeing across the country. Um, but what I wanted to focus on was on this increase in stable um, annual turnover projections. So that group, that 22%. We go to the next slide. This is another. This was another question that came out in the survey, which is about their productivity levels. Um, and what we see here is that 27, 26, actually more like 26% when it's adjusted, but 26% of um, the respondents of that 322 were either more productive than before the outbreak or continuing as as normal, right? Um, and so again, that speaks to some of the resilience that we wanted to investigate through the report and through this research. Um, and some of the highlights, some of the findings are, if we go to the next slide, I didn't want to go into, into you know, sort of deep numbers about this. I just wanted to give you, give you all a sort of a bit of a, a quick highlight. And then the analysis, by the way, is still ongoing. So please do bear, bear with me on this, or at least take this as provisional for now. So of the 22 to 26% of the organization, which have increased the, their turnover, remained stable, become more productive, or had their productivity not affected, a large proportion of them had between one and 10 employees, right? So there was something about the size of organizations and whether or not that speaks to aspects of agility and nimbleness. Now, now even though it's between one and 10 employees, I don't think it's, and the, the, the data is going through, I'm going through the analysis right now. It doesn't necessarily mean that if you're a large organization, you are, um, you know, you're not able to, to sort of get through the pandemic or at least anything like that. What it means, I think more, and this is coming out in some of the interviews as well, is about, how to sort of streamline some of the, the operational potential managerial aspects of, of, the, of the organization, of the creative and cultural organization. If you are potentially a large organization, how do you make it so that the stuff that you're doing is, is, is nimble, is agile, you know, is quicker? Um, another finding obviously is online business models, really important, you know? So many, many of the organizations in that 22 to 26% generate income through an online business model. And that, you know, like for some people that, that could be a no brainer, but um, delving into the statistics, it was quite interesting to see, see what that was, was all about. Pivoting, which is what we're actually going to be talking about more today. So many were able to pivot to online delivery to generate a partial or a substantial income. Um, diversity. Now, diversity within the organization does play a role, right? But again, the, the analysis is ongoing, and I'm still trying to, to sort of figure out where exactly um, that is. We go to the next slide, please. Um, collaboration with other sectors, that became really important as well, that came out. So, and that's collaborating with external sectors outside of the creative and cultural sector. So maybe agribusiness, um, education, um, health and well-being. that was another really important one. Engaging with support and anchor organizations was really important, that came up within that 22 to 26%. So engaging with um, studio space providers, hubs, business support, training programs, they all seem to play a role here. Subsector, of course, played a huge role. Um, advertising and marketing, animation, audio and radio, and of games and visual arts seem to fare the best. Whereas, and this may come as no surprise to many, theater, music production, and music venue management were hit the hardest. Um, government support was really important as well. So 66% um, of that 22 to 26% actually received some form of financial assistance. And we'll talk about that later on today. And then location, that was another important one. So there was three pretty big clusters, Bristol, Cornwall, and Somerset. They had the highest concentration of these organizations. So 
in a nutshell, um, that is basically what we, um, what the research is showing, but there's a lot more to it. And that's gonna, I, I didn't wanna give everything away, give away thunder, but that's gonna be coming out through the report. If we just go to the next slide. Um, that's my email address. So if anybody wants to get in touch about getting the, the final report, please do email me and I'll res respond as quickly as I can. So the report should be available by the end of March or early April. Um, that's my presentation. I think what we'll do now is, um, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to pass on to our three panelists. Um, Alex, can I start with you? Of course you can. Thank, Thank you, you Tarek. That was really interesting and just a real insight into how resilient everyone has been. Um, I think resilience is a really lovely word and so that was really lovely to see. Um, so yeah, so my name's Alex and I am, or what feels like in a past life, <laughs> the Executive Director of the Theatre Royal Bath Theatre School, which is predominantly housed within the Egg Theatre, uh, which is dedicated to making or programming work for and with young people. Uh, so more recently, I'm the Executive Director of the Egg Assembly, which is our new digital strand to our theatre training and output. Uh, which has been funded by Innovate UK since June last year. Um, so the last eight and a half months have been a journey. Um, I'm sure like many of us, uh, we had this almost reluctance towards the digital offering at first. Um, it felt as though we were almost being dictated to that this is how you must create art now in this new world. Um, however, uh, we then started to view this new space as our digital playground, the extra auditorium, the extra rehearsal room we always wanted and could never have, um, and the tools that we couldn't possibly imagine up for grabs as well. Um, so now we're embracing it. So our turning point was very much an attitude and realisation that we didn't just want to adapt for the current situation. Uh, but evolve. So both our practice, our outlook on how you create art, uh, the multifaceted training we can offer young people and hopefully the future of theatre as well. So our first line of discovery was exploring all the different branches to the creative industries which is just vast and blew my mind. Uh, so things that we looked at um, and are offering at the moment, so soft robotics and animatronics, delving into the world of Arduinos, hacktivism, creative coding, VR, um, and then trying to find the people that could work with young people and open their minds to these practices as well. So we very much believe that everyone has the right to a space to be creatively curious and that young people aren't just adults in training. Uh, so why for so long have some of these skills only been open to people as adults or formal education settings or closed behind huge financial barriers? Uh, and the next and our current adventure has been about finding creative digital tools that can impact and help develop learning and understanding. So we are developing a chatbot as a creative digital companion, offering provocations and discussion that can help facilitate curiosity, allowing a young person to follow their fascinations and empower them to make their own decisions. Uh, we're also exploring choose your own adventure type digital story technology that acts as our creative learning package alongside our shows that hopefully we'll get to put on soon. Uh, digital badging to reward and recognize all those like soft skills that we know exist when exploring train and training in artistic disciplines. Um, I think part of the journey as well is recognizing that we are the creative problem solvers, like all of us that are listening and are part of the panel today as well are all the creative problem solvers. Uh, we just weren't sure of what our tools were when we first were thrown into this world. Uh, and definitely by no means are we now experts at the egg uh, in the tools. And much like anything, you know, the more you learn, the more you realise you know very little. Um, however, I feel like we found more joy in the journey of discovery than we originally anticipated. There is all this kind of talk about going back to normal. Um, but I don't think we will, and I don't think we necessarily should. You know, this time has been a massive learning experience. 
and we should utilize those skills understanding and the tools uh, to start our new world really and that's kind of our little story over the eight and a half months <laughs> That's brilliant, Alex. Thank you so much for that. I'll come back to you about some specific questions and we'll facilitate discussion. That's great. Um, Jack, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, so uh, I am Jack. I'm director of BRICS. We are a Bristol-based nonprofit um, working with uh, artists and communities in Bristol. Uh, so we have kind of four main areas of practice. We work on community-led creative projects. Um, especially in St. Anne's in Brislington. Um, we work on public art projects, so working with local authorities and developers to uh, write and produce public art programs as part of new developments. Um, we work to secure uh, the spaces that our communities need to thrive, both now and, and in the long term, which we see as um, kind of part of a kind of social infrastructure, creative infrastructure thread. And then we work on artist development, so that runs through all of our practice. Um, this time last year, yeah, things have changed a lot. And we've come as a small, really, we're a really small organization. Um, we kind of formally constituted as a charity in 2019 and came out of a research project we'd done and part, um, which kind of followed on from my work that I'd done with Antlers Gallery as a nomadic organization. Um, this time last year, we were working with uh, on a project called uh, like St. Anne's Creative Community Mapping. So we'd been working with the community to understand through an asset based community development model. Um, what was going on in the area, what people wanted to see, and we'd been invited into that community because they had an interest in or have an interest in um, some form of, kind of community hub and creative projects. Um, unfortunately, all of our, well, all of our projects in St. Anne's were all focused on bringing people together, about reducing social isolation, about like places for people to meet in real life. So, you know, we definitely, you know, pivot is definitely the right word. You know, we had had to really think about you know, with our community, with the way that project works is that we work with a arts action group model. So we've got a group of local residents who steer the project. And um, yeah, we didn't feel like digital move at the stage that project was at was it was right to go move it to a digital delivery or a di digital engagement, um, especially because people also had so much life stuff going on in that moment. And, um, and also, of course, with digital exclusion, not everyone would have access to those um, to contribute into those kind of co-design event, uh, events and processes. And um, so we kind of, with the community, really decided to put that on hold for a bit for the summer. And then we re reawoken that project later on. Um, we did apply, oh yeah, so what we did, what we did do, we um, uh, applied, we got some support from Arts Council England emergency funding but through the non-NPO strand and that really enabled us to um to, to survive the process to the, of the year so we set up BRICS artist program so it's a, a network of and, and community of 75 um, artists visual artists in Bristol and the west of England we've done podcasts um we've uh, commissioned podcasts with different artists some micro commissions of um, research projects um, a series of weekly talks on Wednesdays to bring people together and kind of share practices and share learning. Um, we had set up an artist sales platform, which we weren't doing with Bricks before, but I have previous experience of through Antlers. And we did some workshops, so governed, um, selected by the community of artists we were working with. Um, so that, that was a six month pilot and that's just come to an end. And we're looking at what the future is for that next. Um, but yeah, it was really about bringing people together. The, the, I think the main value really was having a forum for shared peer-to-peer um, -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer support and thinking about where those opportunities were and how, um, you know, how, how artists could be more resilient um, as individuals, as well as it contributing to our own organizational resilience. And the, the other thing I'd just say quickly is that the, um, yeah, the other thing that we did, we didn't know obviously if we'd get the Arts Council fund <laughs> um, and it was that, you know, tricky times so um, we are really focused at the beginning of the lockdown on building our public art consultancy so through this last year we already had one contract but through this we've built it up so we're now delivering projects in St Paul's in Lockleys in Easton and in Stoke Gifford <laughs> yeah um, so uh, and we've you know through the through the pandemic we started off with me being the only employee 
and then having external freelancers that we worked with. We've now got two employees. We're working with an MA curating placement from UWE. We've had six pay paid placements through various universities and um, creative workforce of the future. And uh, yeah, that's me, that's us. Thanks, Jack, that's brilliant. Again, like I was saying, I have, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll, I'll get to them later on. Um, Mel, do you want to go next? Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great, um, hi everyone, I'm Mel Rodriguez. I'm the founder and creative director of um, Gritty Pearl, which was a production company that I founded about a year before the pandemic. So we were just getting going on filming and live events when we had to stop. Um, and I'm now founder of a media tech company uh, called Gritty Talent, which is uh, the talent arm of our, the company, which really I've been growing for a while, but actually it kind of had to amplify and be kind of built on heat type thing once we realized that we couldn't do stuff on the ground um, for the whole of 2020 and some of 2021, I think. Um, a bit of my background, so um, I'm not a techie, I can't code. Um, what do I do? Um, I spent about 18 years working in factual TV production, having an amazing time traveling all over the world, making all types of factual programs, current affairs films, um, Horizon, Crime Watch. One show was probably a low light, but I'll, I'll talk about that another time. Um, but the, for me, my job has always been about people um, people problem solving and being on the ground uh, and so for me that's probably been the most hardest the hardest of transitions has been how you can still do people work when you're not seeing the whites of their eyes and when you're not able to really make contact so um, my company I founded it really based on the principle that, that the media industry try as it might was not as diverse as it should be and that's diverse in the widest sense so that's the stories you tell the voices that you um, the voices that you give a platform to uh, and the way that you, you portray people and that's the on-screen stuff also the talent pipeline um, is mostly made up still of people who are from more affluent backgrounds tend to be white middle class backgrounds um, of which I am actually you know my, my dad's um, an Asian born sorry, a Kenyan born Asian not a Ke Asian born Kenyan my dad's a, a Kenyan born Asian but you know I've grown up bit, you know as a white person really my mum is, is a white lady from Essex so I've had some of those cultural issues and also being a woman as well but I have been very aware of a lot of the um, diversity and inclusion issues in the media industry for a long time so I left my very comfortable BBC job um, on reflection I could have been on furlough right now on a you know an 80% BBC salary furlough type scheme uh, but I left my BBC job um, at the end of 2019 to, to, to make um, to try and do a talent-led company for, for, for TV, so using grassroots talent and, and all of our community contacts to try to make content that is more reflective. And my key way for doing that was going to be through mentoring, nurturing, uh, workshops, networking, basically everything that involves being in a room with people um, to try and solve this problem. So the, the business model had to completely flip this time last year um but you know from that has come these most amazing learnings and i hope that i can share some of those with you um today um a bit more about where kind of some of these ideas came from so um i think one of my favorite phrases in life is now nothing is wasted and, and sometimes i find myself doing stuff and wonder why am i doing this um but i went on a journey um that i started about five years ago to to run uh, tedx bristol in my spare time that's bristol's uh, ted talks and I was doing it obviously pro bono while I was doing a very difficult job at the BBC. I was working in factual development, having to get on a train to London every other day to pitch to commissioners, quite stressful. And I'd also taken on running this massive event in my spare time. So a lot of my friends didn't see me for, for about a year. Um, but it was running TEDx Bristol that actually gave me those skills that I think I've been able to use now in this flip. Uh, to, to doing both the talent work and also the digital work because actually through TEDx I got to meet all these technologists who we were producing talks for and they and I learned a bit about being a tech entrepreneur um, and the other important thing that happened between 2015 and, and now uh, running TEDx was my understanding of the talent pipeline problems so um, a lot of our volunteers came to TEDx because they wanted to work in the creative industries but they didn't know how to start and they couldn't afford to give up their full time jobs or, you know, do lots of unpaid work experience to get the foothold. And that's often a problem in, in the creative industries is that if you are a, a carer, a parent, you know, a career changer, someone who doesn't have a lot of 
finance saved up in the bank. Being able to get into the industry is really difficult because it's it starts off being relatively low pay and, 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 and a lot of work is done for free to start off with. So via TEDx, we developed this kind of bite-sized way of people just dipping in over the year and doing bits of work experience, you know, in a very, in a remote way, which has actually served us really well now, um, but also in a way that meant that they could just dip in and have a go at an aspect of production, have a go at the story curation, have a go at marketing, have a go at social media, but not be under that pressure of doing a, a big intense placement or run a job or whatever it was. So we, we actually developed a really good way to do talent pipeline development. And um, I'd like to reflect on that later because I think one of the ways we're going to get ourselves out of the pandemic is being much better at championing all kinds of talent and giving people opportunities to work part-time and in those flexible ways. And I, I'd love to talk a bit more, more about that later, but my, my, um, my, the backbone of you know, where I am now doing TEDx, I realized that we can do, we could do this work um, and it's something I became really passionate about. So when I founded Gritty, Gritty Pearl, it was like, right, yeah, we're gonna be on the ground. We're gonna do mentoring, filming, coaching. We're gonna take the TEDx model and we're gonna do it you know, in a commercial model. Um, and we, la we launched the talent arm 10 weeks before lockdown, uh, we, we on, onboarded our, our cohort. Um, we chose 10 people to work with. You know, we had all these plans for all these exciting things. Um, and then we had to shut down. So um, I'll probably leave it there for now. But the, the pivot story that I guess I, you know, I can show a bit later is about how we kind of scraped ourselves off the floor, having cried quite a lot um, for, <laughs> for a few days and, and decided to still do that work, but do it in a very different way and do it in a digital space and, and, and using technology. Thanks, Mel. That's really great. Um, I've got so many questions. And I guess I guess the question that I'd like to put to all of you, I guess, at this point is we'll get into the discussion is how far, I mean, just thinking about what you just said, Mel, about you know, sort of pulling yourself off the ground, you know, how far from your core offer, right, do you feel that you were pushed by by the pandemic? And where you're at now, do you feel like this is is this a short-term strategy? Is this a medium-term strategy? Like what's gonna stick for you, I think now? Is there, are there things that are actually gonna stick? Or are you, if, if we do go back to normal, if the vaccine program proves to be the silver bullet panacea that a lot of people are starting to talk about in the news right now, um, you know, I guess the question is how much of your current offer would you return back to the way they were pre-pandemic? -pre I guess whoever wants to go, whoever wants to answer that. Shall I pick up and then I'll yeah, be quite right yeah. So, so I was really conscious of not pivoting in a knee-jerk reaction to technology. So, uh, very similar to Alex's comment about, oh, quick, quick, do digital, be digital. What, what does that mean? And I think I experienced this at the BBC when the BBC was like, quick, quick, we need to make all of our best programs digital, and they just put clips online and it didn't work, and no one watched them because it hadn't been crafted in a way that worked for that audience. So, I so. Part of the picking up myself up the floor, off the floor after I'd stopped crying was just actually thinking. And I probably sat and thought for about a, a week or so about, okay, how do we do this so that it isn't just a quick fix and we don't just stick a plaster over it and we do it for a bit and it, it, we make do. How do we do this so we can actually start to build legacy? So, uh, so to in answer to your question type, for me, I was like, if I'm going to design some technology, I want it to be better than the thing that I was going to do originally so that when we do come out of the pandemic and I'm an eternal optimist so I knew we were going to get there and we are now nearly there um you know so that when we return the thing that I'm doing actually we can still do but it will have actually made what we do better so um and that takes quite a lot of brain effort particularly when you're you know stuck at home and and I actually think I had COVID in March as well so I had a rubbish I had a rubbish first month of as, a, as most people did I was ill for, for about a week anyway and I think that actually being in bed and, and feeling ill and but I just had time to think and I just thought the thing that I want to build now needs to be sustainable and you know we mentioned the word resilient and I think it needs to be resilient to future shocks because this isn't going to be the last time that we have to shut up shop and stop doing stuff on the ground temporarily be it so I wanted to find a solution that would work into the future and create actually better ways to do things um but but i didn't know how to do that and it's taken a year actually to kind of work it out yeah it's it is a journey isn't it alex jack did you want to yeah i think um you saying mel the knee-jerk reaction and that's something that we 
we have spoken quite a lot about at the egg in the education department and uh with the young people that we work with you know when everything locked down we were so keen and itching to just kind of get out there and connect with our, our young people again and but actually it's been what's been the biggest joy is having the time and space to kind of step back to think about what's important to us as people as creatives like our values but also um you know what young people want so like you know the amount of discovery and journey we've gone on just kind of talking to our audiences exploring what's out there like it's total role reversal at the moment um we talk about co-learning like we're really we're so keen on co-learning rather than just we're the adults we know best so we're going to teach you um and we are all learning in this world right now and if anything i have learned so much from young people during this time um about resilience and about technology and about everything um so i think yeah having the time and space has been the joy and something that I'm sure all of us in the creative industries, like you spoke Tarek about mental health and things. We're always go, 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 go. What can we do? What can we do better? What can we do now? And um, there has been an element of that. Of course there has, uh, but it's, yeah, it's been wonderful just to kind of experience what, what's out there. Um, so in terms of things going forward, I think uh, everything we've learned and developed during this year, um, will just has has built us into the people that we're going to be tomorrow and the way we approach things so even just even just little things like we you don't need to get on a train to come and have this meeting you can do it in a zoom room but also even like as massive as i understand how this technology works now so i can utilize it in this show in 10 years time and it will be amazing and it'll be everything that we wanted within this story as part of the narrative as well so yeah, massively important about the time and space to develop us and the people we work with as well. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, the, uh, so the question about how much of this are we going to hold on to? So, yeah, so I think, I mean, I guess Bricks was at this stage where we were growing lots of different aspects of our practice and really, yeah, probably do run at things a bit too much <laughs> and try to take on too many things at the same time. So. In a way, this meant that we just had to really focus on what is what are the elements that are going to allow, you know, how are we going to survive this? How are we going to thrive through this? How are we going to support our communities through this? And then focus on those elements. So through this, there's loads that we will hold on to. I mean, one is that we've now got a you know producer in place, excellent producer, who's now delivering these public art programmes. That now is a kind of department <laughs> uh, can now, uh, can now um, you know, develop and be led by someone and can go on to flourish and you know we're also you know just pre-pandemic we we're about to take on sixteen thousand square foot of a building from the council that's now going to happen now <laughs> um so we're going to be doing that in the next few months and that'll bring together and be um you know funding dependent uh, that'll be a um a, a physical space where the bricks artist program can manifest alongside our work with um, communities in St Anne. So we can. The plan is to then, you know, work through a process with those communities to look at what a creative community hub will look like. So these two strands of practice of St Anne's and artist development can now will come together into a new format. Um, and practically, yeah, there's quite a lot of um, there's loads that I'm missing that I'm just looking forward to going back to about face to face working with people, like loads. Um, but um, there is some really, I mean, our board pivoted to starting, God, I use the word pivot all the time now, um, got me started, um, our board changed their way of working, um, so we now meet every month, um, so that we could make um, rapid decisions, and so they were fully informed of all the changes and, and the, the wider circumstances. That works really well on Zoom, <laughs> um, it's a really efficient way to do it, and um, you know, people don't have to travel in. So that's a type of meeting that does work really well for meeting up with artists face to face to come up with ideas. Um, I think that'll be going back to face to face as soon as possible. That's amazing. Um, there was something like from all three of your stories, there's something about, you know, getting the understanding, the offer that you had pre pandemic and turning that offer into something that's actually 
potentially deliverable through some sort of educational program. It's almost like you're drawing on yourself and the educational component has become really important um, because that's, I think, what all three of you have in common is this, this notion that you will, you know, you are, you are helping with programs or whatever, you're helping the sector. There's something that you're pitching into the sector, which I think is really, um, it's kind of, it's really interesting that there's a lot of organizations that are starting to do that, you know, and the online component of it, it makes that so useful. The fact that digital training and understanding becomes, is, um, is kind of the way of the future, I think. And this kind of leads into the next question, which is about your, I guess, the subsectors that you're in. Um, you know, theater, coming to you, Alex, has been, you know, has been decimated by, by the pandemic. And I just wonder, this is kind of related to the previous question as well, you know, how much, how much can we expect from, you know, the sort of the pivots that have been happening versus, you know, the core offer of, let's say, the theater sector, which is actually going to the theater and the whole physical space component, you know, and that can, connects to your question, to your stuff as well, Jack, and Mel as well, you know, about this, the physical component, you know, and how we, how we negotiate that. I wonder if, I'm just speak a little bit about that, you know, about potentially having lost that for the past year and now having, you know, the potential to sort of reap some of that back and um, what you think of it. <laughs> uh, it, it was quite actually, I, I know that obviously the theatre industry has been hit like massively being part of that, but seeing those figures earlier in your slide is quite a, quite a shock just to see them in black and white. Um, and there was definitely an element of kind of mourning of an industry, uh, especially at the start that, you know, I thought we'd wake up and theatre wouldn't exist anymore. And, you know, much like all of us who are in the creative industries, it's so much part of our identity and ourself. So to think that that wouldn't exist, I, it was like I was mourning part of myself. So that was really, really hard. And, um, but I think what's quite interesting is, you know, when we originally started the Egg Assembly, in our original kind of pitch to innovate, it was called the Egg Theatre Assembly. And we actively chose to take out this word theatre, um, not because we're not proud of it and we don't want to champion theatre, um, but we were finding, especially with our kind of on the ground in-person training, the word theatre and the actual physical building of a theatre can be quite uh, daunting, can be quite intimidating. People view it in a certain way. They have a preconception of who theatre is and who it's for. And it's like, oh, well, that's not for me. So this kind of new digital world and being allowed to kind of explore all these creative industries and open those doors to young people, those virtual doors to young people, has hopefully allowed them and also myself and my team to see that you know you can be any form of creativity and expression is theatrical is can be used within theatre to create theatre work but you know we're all about empowering young people to find their creative voice so that's part of this journey as well um i i yeah, in terms of the physical building, I can't wait to actually get into it again. Um, I'm so excited because for me, theatre is my home and I see that. So I hope, though, in this new world where young people are, have been exploring online, they hopefully will now see that theatre can be their home as well, because that's been massively important to me. I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. But it also, I mean, looking at the practicalities of it, the importance of having, you know, of course, you know, believing in the, in the physical space and that one day, you know, you will, we will get back to that point, but also developing that second strand of non-physical activities, you know, and the importance of that. So maybe the future is too pronged for a lot of sectors that have been this, you know, which is about, about both those things, right? Um, Jack Mel, do you want to say anything? before I Yeah, move I, could, I could come in on that. I mean, the nature of the stage that we were at, it went because we weren't running a venue, um, obviously I've done lots of exhibitions and audience focused work before, but we weren't at, we weren't de delivering that. So that wasn't massively a loss to us in terms of the connection with audiences. It was more about what the direction we were going in rather than where we were at. Um, however, definitely in terms of collaborators and team, um, you know, like working with a team, a new team all through remote working and then thinking about what a community of artists that are linked by geography, but aren't able to connect in person, um, how that works and how you build those connections. It's, it's a, you know, especially because I guess you, it suits different people in different ways, doesn't it? So setting up a Slack channel 
I love, <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's, I'm at my computer the whole time. Um, I'm yeah, happy typing, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's a, it's a great way for me to share information and engage with people, but and you know, collaborate through Google Docs or whatever it is. There are lots of things, you know, it's like boring. I talk about such technical, boring things, but you know, these, um, it's not suited to everyone and it you know, didn't, and it, it was probably exclusionary to some people. So actually, I think, you know, in terms of those aspects, I think, you know, there's a real need for us to get back into being in a room together. Um, and yeah. Absolutely. I think for me, there was a real, it's a practical and a money-making issue because uh, live venues have been the model for TEDx since I've, well, since before I started running TEDx Bristol. So we would play to um, 2,000 people at Colton Hall, which is now Bristol Beacon. We, we played to over 1,000 people at Bristol Old Vic in November 2019. I cannot tell you how relieved that the pandemic didn't actually hit us until later because I wouldn't have had insurance to cover cancelling that and losing hundreds of thousands of pounds in ticket revenue. And um, I think this is where our, our big dilemmas are now going to come because of course we want to get back into the venues. Um, I'm currently having a discussion with the incoming curator for TEDx this year so I'm doing a slow handover um, and we're having a really difficult discussion about we really want to be in a Bristol venue, we really want to have a live audience. Um, immediately things like our in event insurance, the cost of production because of the safety you've got, got to put in place with you know more kind of you can sell less tickets but you need kind of space around people you need more ushers you need hygienic things you need you know all these things to ensure that people feel safe and there's also the psychological aspect are people going to feel happy to come into a enclosed indoor space and sit for two hours or sit for a day in my case for TEDx in a room full of people they don't know and breathing in that air um, and my hope is that it really will because we'll have put in place lots of stuff to make sure that it is as safe as it can be but we're going to be living now with this risk that you know we, we just haven't really thought of well we knew about germs being spread but we all kind of just live with it you know so you know uh, but now when someone sneezes and they're next to me like my reaction is different to how it would have been a year ago so all of these things go into your curation of a physical space and i think it is an absolute loss to our industry if we don't reconvene and find ways to use those physical spaces because you know but as jack and alex have both talked about you lose people when you can when you just do stuff digitally and this is something that I've seen particularly with access issues to do with um, uh, people who um, are either partially sighted um, or have issues using technology. Um, I ran a BBC, it was quite embarrassing, I ran a BBC Academy seminar about three months ago and we had a message from, from a partially sighted person saying, I can't, I'm not getting the sound, I can't log on, I can't take part. You know, if we'd been in, on the ground in a room, I would have had one of my team go and help that person and they would have sorted it out. So, um, so there's all these layers of issues that come with, you know, just being digital and there's all these issues that are now going to come and be back on the ground. But um, I, I think we would be back on the ground. And as I think has been said, this is, if there's ever an industry that can solve these types of problems, it's going to be this industry because we are very creative and we're just problem solvers, you know, every day of the week, aren't we? But um, I'm, I think we'll probably run a duality. So for TEDx this year, we're looking at having digital content people can access um, which means we can reach a much larger or larger audience but also maybe having a smaller audience so that we can manage the safety aspects and then once we've got people's confidence back um, I'm really hoping that we can then go big again but I don't know whether we'll be able to have as big a group of people in a room for a while while we're all just readjusting. Absolutely and that has I mean this is going to come on to the next question quickly about about the finances of all of this you know I mean the time the time that's needed to sit back and actually think about things like insurance and how you're going to actually make money on certain aspects or generate revenue or whatever it is. And so the next question is, and I'm gonna try and be quick because we don't have that much time left. So if you could answer quickly, the importance of, um, of government funding, you know? So how important has, has receiving, let's say the, the Arts Council Emergency Fund or Innovate UK funding, or how important has that been to each of your organization? Who would like to go first? I could go quickly. Just yeah, I mean, yeah. it was um, essential really at that moment. We didn't have all of our other income streams were drying up. We didn't know whether public art would, um, you know, the property industry would be awake through this whole thing or what would be happening with that. So yeah, it's um, completely essential. 
And there are elements of support that we would have taken up if we could have, um, such as the business bounce back loan, but we couldn't because we're a CIO, even though Scottish CIOs can. Um, so yeah, there's lo there are lo lots of things that we fell between, and of course, artists falling um, in between the cracks on lots of the support, but yeah, it was in essential to us. We got funding from the Innovate UK COVID impact fund, um, which is so interesting because I just presume that Innovate UK was for people designing big industrial things to do with like aviation and stuff. Um, and actually when I looked into it, um, one of the key industries, because the creative industries is so, such a money earner for the UK, let's face it, um, even now more so with Brexit, I think, and being able to export what we do. So, um, so a big push was how you help the creative industries become more technically smart and use things like AI, which it hasn't really done much of. So we got 100K to develop our talent matching platform, which is using uh, AI and algorithmic work to, to bring forward the talent that is less visible. Um, and without that money, um, I would have had, I was, I was seriously looking at, at, at taking out an extra bit of mortgage on my house to get this MVP done. And I was looking at, um, well, I was already taking on extra scraps of consultancy and production work to do in my spare moments just to kind of keep the, you know, the bills paid while I tried to scramble together what this tech was. So for me, it's an absolute game changer and enabler. And in a moment where a lot of people were losing their jobs, I was able to create four part-time jobs and, and pay three freelancers for work as well. So, um, and so I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of everything the government does, but um, I am a fan of the Innovate UK system because it actually enables people with great ideas um, to, to try them out. Um, and we also got the COVID contingency funding. It wasn't very much, but you know, um, we got 5K from Bristol Council for business con continuation. Or it all it all matters because it keeps you going. Um, and the cost of me not getting those would have been I would have probably closed my business and gone back into being a freelance producer. So it's big, it's big, big deal. Yeah, I will just echo uh, what both of you said. Uh, absolutely essential. I, I mean, there's no kind of secret that sometimes education is the first kind of department to be depleted when, um, when this kind of thing, when this kind of thing happens. But like, it doesn't happen regularly. Um, but unfortunately, because it's just not a money maker. Whereas, obviously, you know, other departments do make money. Um, so uh, the, my t the team that I work with, we wouldn't probably be in our jobs now, um, or we'd be utilising furlough and we'd be sat twiddling our thumbs when we desperately wanted to connect with young people and uh, start making work and uh, support the people that are being forgotten at the moment. Um, and yeah, our massive, um, our biggest kind of, because there's categories in the Innovate, uh, grants our our largest pot was subcontracting which has allowed us to um, offer work to so many freelancers um, that might not have had it uh, w without that money so massive game changer like I probably would not be here um, talking about this now so yeah massively important that's huge and, and I think you know it's no it's, it's no joke with respect to you know how the creative industries is able to, and I hate to talk about it in terms like this, but able to return, make a return on that investment. So the investment that the government makes into the creative and cultural sector now comes back tenfold, you know, later on. So, and as you can, as all of you are actually proving. Um, it's I'm worth, gonna have to- yeah, just to sorry, point, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Tarek, just a final comment. It's worth saying that it's still chronically underfunded. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and there are real problems, particularly for, freelancers who were very late in receiving support and the support hasn't been as good as if you were an employee um, and also there's real problems based on the fact that most of our industry is a series of micro businesses very small companies you have who do not have big reserves so I think our experiences have all been incredibly positive but I know many stories of companies that haven't and I it, I'm not going to get too political but I don't think that all parts of the government recognize the contributions that we make and, and, the, and, the, and the ripple effect, because we don't just make content, we hire people to build sets, we work with engineers, we work with set designers, we work with sound people, we work with, you know, they buy equipment, they buy cameras, they buy, you know, scaffolding. So it's the fanning out, it's not just 
the fact that we create this product, this creative thing. It's the fact that if we can't spend on the ground, all these connected industries don't don't get income. Absolutely, and I think it's incumbent, you know, on on research, you know, like the research that I'm doing to actually to really advocate for that government funding as well, because it's something that's just it's so important. It comes out as so important in the research and the data, and you know, from from anecdotal information as well and all sorts. But I'm going to move on to some of the Q and A questions, guys. Is that okay? See if I can do this properly now. Hold on. And if I mess this up, just talk amongst yourselves. Okay, can you hear me? Wait a second. Can you guys hear? Did you guys hear me? No, I guess not. Um, Bo, do you like, is there any way that you could read out the questions? Sure. I think um, a good cross panel question here would be from an anonymous attendee, which asks, really interesting to hear the panel's thoughts on the longevity and legacy of the efforts. But the transition to digital has made many opportunities and activities within the sector more accessible and affordable, which is positive. However, is there a risk that as restrictions are lifted, could there be a divide between more costly opportunities in person and more affordable available digitally? Or will the continuation of digital opportunities be a positive way of increasing inclusivity and diversity in the sector? Great question. Um, Jack, you talked about digital you know, inclusion as well in this. Do you want to take a start at that or? Sure. I mean, I think that this probably applies most to ticketed performances, this particular question in terms of the income model. Um, you know, in visual arts, which is the predominant side of our work, um, often they're free entry. Um, but we would definitely be um, moving into a hybrid model where there's kind of blended environments for digital experience and in-person experience. That's our plan moving forward. Um, so yeah, th those kind of considerations around accessibility, um, we don't want to lose any of the gains in that area um, in a return to the new normal. Right. I think there's going to be higher cost of production. I talked a little bit about that. You know, I can't see that venues are going to be lowering their hiring fees, you know, to be in spaces. Um, I think there's going to be a real pinch of, of where that cost gets passed on to. And um, I think that the, the danger is that if you pass on the cost in ticket prices, and it's a fair thing to do, but then that excludes certain people from accessing those, those events on the ground. Um, and we've seen it happen online already. Today, there is a diversity conference going on online on Hopin, and it was 150 quid to attend. And I, and I wrote to them and said, given that you're a diversity conference, I don't think this is a very inclusive pricing policy, particularly <laughs> for people who are not, you know, in senior, senior roles in big companies. Um, and they gave me some passes for free, which was great. Um, but my point is that you there has to be a middle road. So I think you have to be able to reach a price point, which is um, going to be affordable for lots of different types of people. Um, and if you can't pass on all of your higher production costs in ticket price, where else does that money come from? Um, and that could be, the, the, there are lots of other avenues, whether it's sponsorship, um, you know, some of the funding routes that we've all gone down. Um, but I am, it's one of my biggest concerns with TEDx that, you know, we're gonna have higher costs, but we still want to be really accessible to anyone who wants to attend and um, we used to give away about 150 seats each year um it, to make it accessible and i'm worried that we will have to give away less because we have to make more money on tickets so um i think we're going to have to work our way through the way i think we're going to achieve it is by having really good partnerships with our venues and and all of the people that help us put on these these live shows and events um whether that be a little bit of pro bono whether it be a longer term deal whatever it is but we'll probably need to do some deals to ensure that we can stay afloat and still offer you know accessible events and content um but don't ever charge 150 quid for an online event would be my top tip for today <laughs> <laughs> um i will just quickly say like one thing that's been really interesting during this 
uh, well, lots of interesting things, but um, we, within a department, keep on going back to this conversation of, you know, um, there's so many different languages in different industries. So one of the hardest challenges is being able to have a conversation with like a web developer and know what they're talking about and then know what we're talking about, because, you know, it's bizarre, the language difference. But I also think with the language, there's also massive discrepancies between um, the cost, people's hourly cost within different industries has been like a massive eye opener. So um, I, it, it's for me as a producer, it's really, really hard thinking about how I structure budgets in the future, because some people are requesting this hourly kind of rate and this kind of fee and and also, you know, different technologies and implementing that in different ways costs wildly different things to what I'm used to, which is just like, you know, costing a metal structured set. So um, I think there is going to be an impact I'm not sure how it's going to be yet, but I think if, as we learn and develop and understand, and hopefully the industries maybe start to align. I mean, it'd be wonderful if, if theatre makers could charge the same as web developers <laughs> in the new tomorrow. I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon, but you know, that's been a massive learning curve and I hope they start to align so that it doesn't impact the audience or the young person wanting to join a course in the future. That's great guys. Um, Bo, do you want to read another question? Of course, yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Olivia Gable. Uh, it would be great to hear from Tarek about the impacts of COVID on diversity within creative businesses, which you touched on in the presentation. I think Jack also mentioned that there were artists they worked with that were falling through the cracks of funding. Do you think that these funding gaps have impacted diversity in the creative industries? That's such a huge question. and. Um, you know, with the analysis that's happening right now that I'm doing on on the survey, the the way I've looked at diversity is that there is so basically seven percent of the survey um, are BAME led organizations, thirteen percent are people with disability led organizations, and thirty two percent are organizations are women or sorry organizations led by women. Um, so within the twenty two to twenty six percent. Um, and I'm still doing the analysis around this. Most of those businesses are actually quite diverse, so they fit into those categories. I'm still trying to figure out, you know, by doing, you know, sort of statistical analysis, what in what areas is diversity um, being affected through this? Um, but it's no, I mean, it's no secret that yes, you know, a, the diversity issue is a huge one. It's, it was a huge one before, you know, before COVID-19, and I think COVID-19 has, as it's done with so many other things. Has probably, you know, this is my hypothesis. It's probably exacerbated the situation, but it's also, um, it's also drawn light to it as well, which is really great. So, in other words, now there is, you know, a concerted effort to make sure that whatever creative sector comes out of this the new tomorrow um, is one that's more, you know, more sort of concerned with aspects of equity and, and diversity. But you know, we're we still have yet, we're still yet to see it in the numbers, if that makes any sense. Right. So as I do statistical analyses and I look, you know, it's still a very unequal playing field. And any tag if you saw the latest figures from the Creative Diversity Network, but it's gone backwards. So in the last year, representation for people with disabilities, um, both you know, physical and, and kind of unseen, uh, representation for um, uh, black and Asian and minority ethnic people in senior roles, decision making roles has gone down. Um, women have have left the industry because they had to homeschool so there's been predominantly women not just women but a lot of mums decided to not do production work in tv because they a they couldn't and b they had to teach their children at home so um the latest figures are that it slid back but you're right the double um i guess this kind of perfect storm that happened with both black lives matter the protests that happened um, and also COVID is it exposed all these inequalities. They've always been there, but it really put shoved them into kind of mainstream consciousness in a way that hadn't been done for a while. So all these big corps, um, including a lot of the creative sector, big, big boys, you know, BBC, Sky, Netflix, you know, they all went, we're doing this, Black Lives Matter. What does that mean? They put hundreds of millions of pounds into their diversity pots and now they're spending it. So I think this shift is brilliant because it's going, you know, people like, um, so BBC now has a 20% diversity rider. Yeah. 
Twenty yeah. percent of your team has to be fame. Uh, you know, 50, so it's 50 50 gender uh, and it's 50 was it 50 20 12 so 50 percent kind of the gender balance uh 20 percent uh bame and, and 12 percent uh, people with, with you know with uh dis disabilities so it's now it's happening but i think my worry is that people who are already very skilled have already moved away from the industry because of all these extra barriers that covid or extra, extra challenges that covid put in place and this is particularly the case of people from working class and less affluent backgrounds who could not afford to stay in the industry and had to take jobs elsewhere just because you had to because you know you just needed to make money so um i think i think we're in this really interesting moment where there's now so much money and effort being put into it but the damage has affected the makeup of our teams and it will probably take a while to build back what i'm absolutely mel thank you like thanks for that i mean what I'm also seeing, and I think it's an important thing to, to, to tease out a little bit from the report, and, I, and that report will be ready, you know, hopefully by the end of March, early April, but thinking about how the diversity question pans out within subsectors, it's very different. You know, if you look at the, the umbrella of subsectors that make up the creative industries, the diversity issue is very different in architecture versus advertising and marketing versus theater and performance versus music production and performance. So all those subsectors, you know, are, in, I guess they're in different positions when it comes to to that issue. But you know, the positive thing is is that you know most sectors understand that this is an issue. You know, and the academic literature has been saying it for years now. Um, so that's really positive. Jack, Alex, want to say anything, or should we move on to the next question? I'm just mindful of time. We're basically I don't think I have kind anything of, to add, but agree with what you're saying. Great. Let's let's move on to, to another question. I think we probably have time for maybe two more questions. Sure, we'll just go, there's a question here from Colin Stakem. Um, Grayson Perry tweeted a poll from a national newspaper last year during the first lockdown, which ranked artists as the top non-essential job, 71%. How do we overcome prejudices against artists and the value of art as a vocation? That's a good question. Alex, do you wanna go first on that? Yeah, um, it, make, it makes my blood boil, um, as I'm sure it does for many of us. Um, and, you know, the whole um, retrain campaign that went out as well. Um, I, I did have an answer and it's suddenly gone in my fit of rage. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's just also that that's what I was going to say. So when we um, first launched the egg assembly, one thing, so we worked with um, a group of young people who became our tea ambassadors, the egg, uh, the egg assembly also equals tea. So we have things like tea break chats and stuff like that. Um, so our tea ambassadors were 10 young people aged 13 to I think 19 was the oldest young person. Um, and one thing that they were really keen on was careers advice for um, the arts and the industry, because a lot of them may have had a careers advisor in school, um, but they know very little about uh, getting into theatre specifically, but a lot about the creative industries. So um, I, I think the more we kind of build up this understanding of the kind of different routes in which you might want to take to get into the industry, that's really important to, to therefore also respect it um, as a, a, a choice for the future and for now. Um, so, so I think it, I think it also stems from that. I think it, it, it happens within schools. I think it's um, putting weight on how important the arts is, but also the fact that um, Yes, it can be tricky to get into the industry, but it, it's definitely not impossible. And you can you can approach it from any different kind of route. And so I, th I think it starts from there. I think it, it it's about people respecting it for for you know what it's due um, from a very young age and from schools as a starting point. It's a really good point, Mel Jack. Do you want to say anything on this or? I, I just say that I hope as the industry becomes more representative that the both uh, in the artists and creative professionals and the stories that we're telling that these ideas of what it is to be an artist and who's represented in there um, will open this up and I think there's kind of maybe a misunderstanding or, or, or you know the arts do need to work harder and think about um, who's represented and how they're represented 
and I think that will hopefully change that figure over time. And on that, on that, I'll, I'll add that I think um, I think academia has a role to play here as well, with respect to the, the the types of research you know that are coming out. You know, again, think, doing research on in different areas of you know the arts and cultural sector and the importance of the arts, the essential importance of the arts. Um, and I think there is work coming out around you know the the importance of the impact that arts has had on health during the pandemic. Um, there's a number of studies underway, so I'm sure. There, there'll be a flurry of activity. I'm sure there'll be a number of publications coming out of that. I think, I really do think policy will change around this, you know, um, but you're right, Alex. I think it starts at school, you know, and, and I think it permeates all the way out through society. I think, Mel, do you want to say yeah, I just say like, I've always been an activist and a bit of a, you know, someone to cause a bit of trouble, but I think that with all of this type of thing that goes on, we just have to fight back and do it in with all, you know, we're so creative. I don't know if any of you remember the Fatima, the retrain Fatima post. Do you remember that? Fatima could work in sober. And like and Fatima was this amazing ballet dancer. And the and the picture the government had used was had been used without her permission. And she wasn't even called Fatima. Um, what happened after that was beautiful. The in uh, across the creative sector people responded and annotated that government job ad saying Look, um, a creative person designed this poster. You know, an artist did this, um, an editor did this. Um, you know, um, a ballet teacher did, you know, and they literally listed all the creative people who had let, um, made that ad possible. And then the government retracted the ad and said it was a bit, uh, what was the word, misaligned or something like that. But I think, uh, you know, it was, yeah, inappropriate. But I think the point is that creative, our, our work is everywhere. Um, look at the, um, what, triple kind of time uptake of Netflix and, and all of the on-demand services during lockdown. It's all creative people making the, the content that people are watching. Look at what's happening on TikTok and YouTube and everything. I think it's all around us. So we just have to be very blunt and brutal about, don't, don't put us down because we make your life nicer. We, we are the gluey bits that make life nice. Yes, I'm not a, a nuclear scientist, but I will make your day happier because I'm making content that, that you really enjoy. And, and I, don't, I, I really don't appreciate people who want to put a value on on, on where you rank in terms of usefulness to society. Um, and if they want to come and chat to me about it, I'll have a further chat with them. That's great, Mel. Great, Bo, should we do one more question? One last question. I know we're over time now, but... Yeah, I actually think it might be interesting to just run past the panel, how they see things for the future. Yes. So that's, yeah, that's a question for, for all of you, really. Um, nice easy one. That's an easy one, you know, with respect to your organizations, but also, you know, the sector as well, potentially. Who wants to go first? No pressure at all. I feel like I've spoken a lot in the last five minutes, but I'll just, I'll just do my quick rundown. Um, a lot of it is some stuff I've mentioned before, but I think that, um, that diversity is going to be our way out because we have to be able to reflect better the people that we serve and it is through working with lots of different people that you'll get your best ideas you'll get your commissions you'll get your funding um, so that's number one number two is how we use technology now to uh, reach 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 harder to reach audiences while doing our core work on the ground so keep the gains that we've had because we've been able to reach people in different ways um, i think the creative sector needs to be better at being tech literate, and I don't mean coding, but I mean getting really comfortable with being in these different spaces. And um, I need to practice what I preach because I'm still learning. Um, I think, you know, we touched on funding. I think other ways to fund, the commission-based funding model is so vulnerable and brittle, and, and that's what COVID proves. So we need to find different ways to source funding, which is again, something that we've been working on. And the final thing I think is that it's connected to all of those things. It's flexible and part-time work. I think that probably the way we build back is creating opportunities where people can, you know, don't have to commit to a full time job because they may now have, you know, caring, caring responsibilities or need to work elsewhere. But um, create, I think that COVID has taught us that we can work at home and that we can still collaborate and that you can still do great work with people. It's not the same, but I think bringing that with us means that we'll be able to work more flexibly and then if covid or whatever the next if the next coronavirus hits in you know god forbid it won't but you know if we did get a similar kind of global shock 
we know what to do so we're not going to be quite we're not going to be kind of completely kind of you know um you know blasted kind of away for so long and we can get on with stuff great points mel i would um totally agree with you mel <laughs> on all of that um i, I would only just add that i think um yeah for us we're definitely thinking about you know where where we can be useful where artists can be useful where we can bring thinking into conversations and maybe whether that's and some of that's about your know, recovery from covid is that about the high streets is that about mental health and well-being is that about the way in which we connect with each other or you know i guess in some ways we're thinking about you know actually what are the things that we really miss as community you know, not just as artists or people in the industry but as humans and as citizens and how we want to how we want to kind of facilitate that coming back together and that celebration and what we've all missed so i think there's a huge role for artists in that and i think we can go really set out a value in that as well yeah i would obviously echo everything you guys have said um i also think that you know during this time we've lot we've learned a lot about ourselves and um and our the way we communicate with other people be it digitally or or in person if we've been fortunate enough to um i think hopefully i really hope that moving forward everyone starts to kind of respect their own kind of boundaries and how much of themselves they can give to their working life um and that everyone respects that for each other as well um and also that uh jogging bottoms are definitely a good thing to wear at work and we can be more productive that way <laughs> perfect for what it's worth i think I'm just going to put my two cents in, even though I'm not on the panel, I'm just chairing the panel, but I do think digital literacy is really important, especially with respect to cultural production and, and diversifying cultural assets to a digital author. And I do think, and this is obviously obvious coming, you know, coming from the sort of the academic aspect, but I think funding and finance skills and business skills are really important as well. And I, I think that's something that's, that's starting to permeate a lot through you know, what funding was available for specific groups and which groups actually, you know, I think there's a number of things that need to be looked into around that. And I wonder, I wonder if there's a way that, that could be democratized a little bit more. And, and it's kind of in, you know, in tune with, with this digital literacy aspect as well. So, you know, free courses or free content out there around how to get Innovate UK funding, for instance, because there's a lot of people that just don't know how to do it, right? Um, and where would you start with that? You know, so where are, the, where are the points of access around things like that? I think are really important. Anyways, I think we should probably call it time, guys. Thank you so much for your time and for doing this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna end. Um, and thank you everybody for tuning in, even though I can't see anybody, which is a bit strange. Um, and thank you for your questions. There were four questions that we didn't get to answer. I think if you could, you know, if you could email me those questions, I can see if I can get some answers for those. If that's all right. But thanks everybody. Thanks for coming in and thanks for for doing this. Great. I think panelists, if you can, if you can hang around for a debrief afterwards. That'd be great. If not, that's fine as well. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks a lot.